Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to Learn and Taste with Crave and Klondike Cheese. Uh, my name is Susan Axelrod. I am the editor of Culture Magazine, and on behalf of the whole culture team, I'm really excited to uh, host this event today. I, um, we have a, a packed house a big crowd and uh, we have lots of presenters. So I'm going to make this very quick so we can get to the program. Uh, before we start a few housekeeping details, um, you, can, you, you all seem to be familiar with the chat and uh, the Q and A. You can ask questions at any time via either mechanism and um, we will answer them either during the presentation or in the Q and A at the end. I hope you all have your cheeses out and warmed up to room temperature. Cheese always tastes better when it's not straight out of the fridge. So if you haven't done that yet, um, take a minute to do that. And I'll tell you who we're going to be hearing from today. We've had a couple of changes based on travel plans or one major change, I guess. First, you're going to hear from Roseanne Crave. Um, let's hang on one second. Yes, first you're going to hear from Roseanne Crave and Beth Crave. Roseanne uh, is the marketing and sales manager at Crave Brothers Farmstead Cheese. She is the third generation of the family to work at the farm and creamery. And then Beth Grave, Beth Crave, sorry, is the director of quality assurance and customer service at this family business. Then you're going to hear from the Klondike folks. So we have... Um, Adam Buholzer, who is a fourth generation master cheesemaker and the vice president of production for Klondike. He has a master's cheesemaker's license in Feta and Havarti and is working on becoming a master in Gouda and Brick. So after we hear from these presenters, then we're gonna go back to um, Roseanne to make a cheese board. So without any further ado, we're gonna get started. And um, let's go to Roseanne and Beth. Hi, thank you for that intro. Uh, we're here in our tasting room in Waterloo, Wisconsin, about half an hour uh, from Madison, Wisconsin, and about an hour from Milwaukee. So hello if anyone else is from Wisconsin or in the Midwest. Um, we are a farmstead cheese factory, which means that we have our own cattle that we milk three times a day, and the milk is pumped directly over to our cheese factory and we produce various award-winning cheeses. Some of them are pictured here. Um, we have a variety of fresh mozzarella, and I'll let, I'll let Beth go a little bit more in detail about uh, what we produce and sell retail. Sure. So some of uh, in the box today, you guys received our marinated fresh mozzarella that we'll be sampling later. It's an olive oil canola oil blend with a, a custom spice blend all ready to go, ready to serve as an appetizer. Uh, we make other varieties of fresh mozzarella that you can see pictured in there from the smallest size of a pearl, which is a two gram like pearls on a necklace, all the way up to one pound balls and one pound logs. Great for slicing for pizzas and salads and uh, casseroles and different things. Uh, we also make Mascarpone, which is a soft Italian cheese similar to cream cheese. Uh, this is the main ingredient in tiramisu or other cheesecakes and desserts. It's great and uh, we have a chocolate mascarpone pie recipe that you can find on our website that's to die for. And we, uh, variation of that, we make a chocolate mascarpone um, all ready to go for you. It's a chocolate and Irish cream flavored mascarpone, great for dipping with cookies, vanilla wafers, fresh fruit, and so on and so forth. We also make cheese curds. Who doesn't love a Wisconsin squeaky cheese curd? Um, there we make uh, fresh cheese curds weekly. You can find those locally, and also you can buy them online at a retail store. And uh, we also make part skim mozzarella string cheese. Fun for the summer, fun for the kids, string apart, um, have at a party, um, and so on and so forth. So. Those are a sampling of all of the cheeses that we make. A little bit more about our family and farm operation. As Roseanne said, we're a farm set operation, um, meaning we only use our cow's milk to produce all of our cheeses. And on the screen here, you can see a picture of, of what our farm looks like. 
And in the front, lower front uh, right corner, you're gonna see two um, circle domes. Those are digesters, methane digesters. So we take the other byproduct from the cow, mm, the manure, and we put it in as uh, we say a crock pot, which that produces, the manure produces methane gas. We capture that. It turns a generator, which powers an engine and creates enough electricity to power our farm, our cheese factory, and additional 300 homes continuously year round. So we're considered a carbon negative company because we produce more energy than what we can use on the farm. So here's a cute little baby calf. Um, we raise our animals from uh, little baby calves and then as they grow, they eat different food, similar to, you know, humans would. Um, they start with milk and eventually move on to super nutritious foods that help them stay healthy and happy and productive with their milk. Um, we do milk three times a day and we use almost all of our milk from both of our locations to produce all of our cheeses. So we, we need your help with picking a name for this calf. So drop some ideas in the chat. As Rosanne said too, we're a family owned and operating business. So um, Rosanne and I are third generation part of the farm and the cheese factory. And overall, we have over 15 family members that work on the farm or the cheese factory supporting our family business here in Waterloo, Wisconsin. Hi. <laughs> uh, Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Adam Buholzer with Klondike Cheese. I'm Tina Buholzer, so um, uh, this is my husband. Um, and yeah, so we got a nice picture of the, some of the family um, and another one of our master cheesemakers here is uh, I'm pictured and then my brother-in-law, Matt, my uncle Dave, my uncle Ron, my father Steve and, and Ron Bechtold. Um, so we have six master cheesemakers here at Klondike. Um, very fortunate to have have them um you know so obviously we are a, a family business um fourth generation uh my great-grandfather emigrated here in 1925 from switzerland and uh made a lot of variety of different cheeses here on, at this site over the years it was actually a swiss cheese plant up until around 1970 the uh at one time in green county where we are so yeah again um, step back we're located in monroe wisconsin which is about an hour straight south of madison pretty close to the illinois border and uh yeah back in the day they said uh green county was really known for swiss cheese there's a swiss cheese plant almost every square mile you know back when you know farmers had a real hard time getting their milk to the factory of course with by wagons and things there are a lot of little cheese factories and so we were one of them small uh swiss plants up until Around 1970, the uh, Swiss cheese market, at least for factory our size, got kind of tough and we had to look for a new cheese. And so we got into Colby, uh, a lot of Longhorns, Colby Longhorns, uh, Monterey Jack, so, some cheddar. Um, and that actually went good for a while through the 70s for us. And then in the early 80s, uh, again, kind of had to look for new markets. And uh, about mid 80s, we got into some of our current mixes that we still make today. So we make uh, a lot of feta cheese that we started in the mid 80s. Uh, and that's one that obviously got in your pack, our Odyssey feta. Um, about the same time in the mid 80s, we also started our Munster cheese. And that's another cheese you got um, in your pack. And then in addition to those, um, early 90s, we had, we had a Barty cheese. Um, and then actually, uh, while it's up here, um, there was a picture of the curd there and at the end of our coagulator, some pictures coming through. Our, that's our feta cheese curd uh, at the end of our coagulator. The, uh, the feta is, uh, it's a soft cheese, so it's got to be really gentle. It takes really good uh, gentle curd handling equipment. It's one of the keys to making it. So we have a, a real sophisticated coagulator is called that um, actually is able to fill the forms by gravity. And that's one of the reasons why we have such good feta cheese is very, very uh, gentle curd handling. Um, but yeah, I just finished the history. I guess I got up to the early 90s. We also started making uh, Havarti in the early 90s. And then uh, and then in the 
all the way up to, I guess, 2013, we got into Greek yogurt and uh, Greek yogurt dips and sour cream. And so that's our third main avenue. And so we kind of got three plants here. We've got our, our Greek yogurt plant, which also makes, like say, sour cream and dips. Um, and then we've got our feta cheese plant. And then we've got our semi-soft plant in which we make uh, Munster Brick Havarti. And then actually I skipped over Gouda. We just got into Gouda uh, just a few years ago. So, but that's a similar make, a similar semi-soft cheese to our Munster and our Brick. Um, you know, from there, I know I was, uh, part of my spotlight was to talk about the master cheese making. Um, um, the program that first I just say it's a great program. Um, really proud of it. Um, you know, to become a master first, you gotta have your license cheese maker license for 10 years, uh, to get your step back, to get your license, uh, your regular cheese maker license, I should say, um, you gotta work in a factory for at least a year. And then it's a pretty extensive, about a hundred page, uh, question test. Um, that goes through all aspects of cheese making, um, you know, all the way from, of course, quality to the cheese making uh, and details and everything else involved to, to the milk coming in, bulk, bulk milk handling, uh, the whole aspect. So you, you, you get that and pass in your licensed cheese maker, and then you've got to have 10 years of experience after that in the plant making those cheeses, and then you can apply to be your master cheese maker. Um, and then the way the program works is if you're accepted, um, they'll come and one big part of it is they'll come and actually on site and grade your cheese with you, some um, real high end graders and, and CDR and, uh, and uh, Dairy Farmers of America will have a representative there as well. They'll come on site and uh, grade your cheese with you. And it's gotta be obviously the highest quality to, to make that master mark. And they'll do that at least three times over the process of you getting certified. And then there's also a long list of, you gotta have all your classes, you know, in addition to the, um, so there's a long list of class, like prerequisite classes you have, have to have, like um, some examples would be, they've got, you know, a, a lot of different classes, like there's just basically a, a real basic four day cheese day short course that they're going goes through everything and cheese making It's a great course. So there's a, for example, a CIP course, uh, uh, a food safety course is obviously always important, really big. Um, you know, I know I'm missing some, but there's probably a good six, seven, eight courses uh, while your pasteurizer license um, that course. Um, but yeah, there's a good seven, eight courses you got to go through um, covering all aspects again of cheese making. And uh, then finally, when you, you have all that done after about three years, then um, if you complete all that, then there's a test, there's a, a hundred page, uh, 100 question, I should say, essay that uh, is actually, it's open book, but it, it takes, they say anywhere on average of 40 to 80 hours to uh, to complete it because it is a lot of long, long essay answers and you actually have to cite, um, cite any references as you go. Um, and so it, it is a tough test, but uh, it, it really helps kind of put everything together at the end, you know, everything you've studied, everything you've learned, you kind of got to Get all your thoughts down on paper so it's, it's a great way to finish the program um so yeah i couldn't be more prouder of it and there are other you know master cheese makers i think it's a it's a great tool to uh, always you know make sure we are making the best cheese but also obviously it's a great marketing tool then to, to showcase that adam i have a question for you um what kind of milk is used for the odyssey feta yeah, that's a good question. I skipped over. We're really fortunate. We've got about 75 patrons uh, down by us in Monroe. We do about a 45 minute arc around the plant roughly for the most part. And so obviously it all starts with great milk. And uh, and so, yeah, so, but anyway, <laughs> it is cow's milk for the feta cheese. Um, you know, I see uh, somewhat traditionally in Greece, it's made from sheep and goat's milk, but there's just not much of that available in our area. And so we developed a recipe that, that uses cow's milk. And, and obviously we've been uh, won a lot of awards with it and uh, very proud of it, um, but it is a, a cow's milk feta. And I'm uh, just backing up a minute. You guys source your milk. You don't, you're not a farmstead operation. Is that right? That's correct. We're not farmstead. Yep. yep. Okay. Because we have a question about how many cows are milked each day. So that's a question when we get back to the, to the, uh, the crave um, crave ladies. 
So does anyone have any questions about master cheese making for Adam? We've got, let's see. Um, oh, what kind of rennet do you use in the feta? Animal or vegetarian? We do use a microbial rennet that's vegetarian. Mm -hmm. Great. Great, good. Any other questions about the whole master cheese making process? And we can come back to Tina and um, Adam later, but yeah, I think you have some more slides, right? Yeah, in general, as he was talking about, those are just pictures of our retail products. Um, it has the semi-soft cheeses, so the Munster Brick, Havarti, Gouda, and then the, the flavored Havartis. Um, those are a separate plant from our feta plant, but we, um, and then the Greek yogurt. Yep, you can go into the Greek yogurt. As he mentioned, we started that in 2013. So, um, and that's been a wonderful addition to the cheese side of it, adding the dairy, the other dairy piece of it. Um, and expanding on that, which we don't have the picture up, but we have the dips. So there's a, a, a Greek yogurt dip, a tzatziki, um, other forms of, of yogurt that um, he also manufactures and we make here on site. Great. And we have a, not a question, but a comment. Uh, I had no idea the master cheese maker certification was so complicated. Well, neither did I. <laughs> so yes, and we got someone else who said same here. So it was fascinating to learn about all of that. And, and Wisconsin's the only state that actually requires that or offers that opportunity. So no, none of the other states in, what's in the US um, have that type of certification or program for that certification. So when they use a little symbol that has the badge that says Wisconsin cheese or proudly Wisconsin cheese, um, that's why it's just important that you know really excellent cheese comes from all of the cheesemakers in Wisconsin and especially those that you know have masters too. That's great. Um, uh, we also have a question: Can uh, the, is the Greek yogurt available at any retailers in California? You know, um, it. We do have California distribution, um, definitely for the feta cheese. Um, the Greek yogurt is still kind of working its way in because it's in the dairy department where the feta is usually in the deli department. Um, but we do have on our website under odysseybrands.com is a store locator. Great, that's really Thanks. helpful. Yeah, mm -hmm. terrific, good. And that's a beautiful looking cheese board. Yes. Uh, Roseanne's going to make another one, which is going to be just as beautiful. <laughs> Great. Um, oh, Carol, Carol is asking, should I be eating these beauties as we go or wait for tasting tips? Well, I think you can do whatever you like, Carol. But mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I think we're, we're just about to go over to the cheese board now, unless you guys have more that you'd like to add. You know, maybe just real quickly, I, I thought I was going to maybe just mention the, the dips like Tina touched on. You know, one nice thing is um, we do make some Greek yogurt based dips, which are actually a lot healthier. You know, a lot of the dips out there are just um, your normal 18% fat, sour cream based. And once you get into the Greek yogurt based dip, it is a lot healthier. You know, it's lower fat and also higher protein. So you can, you can sit down and if you eat, you know, half a dip container, you don't have to feel bad because it's actually pretty healthy. So it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, the, the dips are, are a nice addition to our line as well. And I encourage you, maybe you see some of those uh, Greek yogurt dips out there, they're, they're, they're tasty. And what what flavors do you have besides the tzatziki? Yeah, um, it's a good question. We've also got a, a French onion and also a red and green bell pepper. And uh, the third one or fourth one, I should say the uh, Southwest flavor. Sound delicious. What about your distribution on the East Coast? Yeah. Um, again, we touch all the stores, some of the stores. I'm trying to, um, the, the store located would be great, but I, I, I not like, um, is it Food Lion or Giants Food Lion? Um, I, I, the grocers on the East Coast, yes. I, I, I'm not quite for sure. <laughs> That's okay. I'll use the but, store locator. Didn't mean to trump it to sort of stump you with that question. Well, there's so many stores all around on each coast that it's, it's yes, it's great, but <laughs> yeah. Sorry. That's okay. No, no, I'll, I'll use the store locator. <laughs> Any other questions? 
Okay, so we'll pivot back to Roseanne and Beth, who will make a cheese board. And before you guys get started, I have a couple questions um, from the, your earlier presentation. Number one, how many cows do you milk every day? Yeah, um, so we milk 2,000 cows uh, three times a day at our facility. Um, so that equates to over a semi milk a day of milk. Um, we use hours old milk to produce all of the cheeses right here on our farm. So um, weekly we produce over 1 million pounds of milk that's turned into cheese. That's amazing, wow. And then, and then another question, um, regarding the methane digesters, do you collect manure from other operations as well or are the digesters run off manure from your farm exclusively? And, and I also should say a lot of high praise for the sustainability efforts. Thank you. Um, first off, I do wanna say to uh, the family and the brothers, the owners, that's what they strive for. They look to, for sustainability practices that are going to be here and that we can sustain for the next generations to come on our farm so we can be repeatable in what we do and the future of agriculture here. Um, the digester here on our farm is um, solely, we solely use our cow's manure on, from our facility, but we also have some other organic material um, that is brought in um, like grease or sunflower oil any organic material can go into methane digester, digesters that produces gas. Um, but our digester on our farm only uses our, our manure. Great, thank you. Another mm -hmm. comment of um, woot woot for the methane capture and reuse. <laughs> we, we do have, if um, you have our, on the marinated fresh mozzarella um, cups, you, do, you will see on the container, um, there is a green logo on here. It is a calf or a cow that has a green leaf for a tail. And it says produced with renewable energy. This logo was created by us to signal to customers um, all over the US to let them know that we use sustainable practices um, on our farm. And you can find that on all of our packaging. Great, excellent. All right, well, I think everyone's ready for this cheese board. Good, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I did um, send with the cheeses, just a little cheat sheet um, that you can utilize today or in the future. Um, I'll start by saying cheese boards are perfect for social events. Um, they're fun to build with other people and they're fun to show off. And you can use them at a date night, a wedding, and any kind of occasion. They're perfect because you can make them very pretty and very versatile with the different flavors and uh, products that you use. So today we will be making a Wisconsin cheese board. If you can't see, there's, there's a Wisconsin engraving on this. So the first thing you wanna do um, is prep all your cheeses and your meats. So that's what I have done here. Uh, when you prepare your cheeses, you wanna use different shapes um, you want cheeses with different colors, different textures and flavors, of course. Uh, when you have your, what we call a vehicle, so today it's a cheese board, sometimes it's a table, sometimes it's a plate. Uh, you can really use anything, you can be creative with it, um, use different colors, different accents. So once you have your vehicle and your cheeses prepped, I always recommend to start with your cheeses when placing a board. Um, and the secret is you wanna split up the colors and the textures. So I have various cheeses that Klondike was happy to share along with um, a few other Wisconsin uh, companies, products, and of course our cheddar cheese curds. So you can start by just picking any, any type. So I'll start with the Gouda here. Um, I like to just kinda have different placement styles. You can do piles, you can do shingles, um, just anything to add texture and height. So then next I'll move on to the Havarti. Hey Roseanne, I'm yep. sorry, can you move that cracker box that's in the front out of the yep. way and then we can see the board better and maybe move the board a little more to the front. Perfect, okay. nope, towards, towards the screen. Great, got it, excellent, good. 
So you can really use any type of cheese. Um, I generally like to have, you know, some type of a hard cheese. Um, today we have a Bella Vitano, which is similar to like a Parmesan texture. Um, for the feta, I decided to use a small little glass and I'll throw on some cheese cakes. So once you have your cheeses plated, um, you can move on to your meat. So for today's purpose, I created a little salami rose using a cup. We'll see if it wants to hold up. Good. Get a close shot yeah. Of that. yeah. You can get a close shot. Yes. Yeah, we can see that. Can you talk a little bit about how you did that, Roseanne? Sure. So it's very simple. Um, so you want to find, I like to use glasses that are similar um, radius or diameter as like a wine glass or even like a flute for Prosecco. And basically what you do is you take your salami. Um, it can be any size. Obviously the, the bigger piece of salami, the bigger your flour is going to be. And then you just basically press it along the edges of this um, cup and you want to overlap it ever so slightly. And I, I usually do two to three layers um, just to keep it dense um, and keep its shape. But then once you're done, you flip it over and shimmy out your cup and then you have a beautiful rose that people can slowly pick off um, or you can use it mostly as decorations and have other pieces of meat out so people can still you know, try some of the uh, charcuterie. So another way to do it is you can just take your slices and simply layer it across the board or you could fold it like this or even like this and place it just to give some, some color and give it some pop. Um, so once you have your meats added, then you can move on to, I usually do the accents like crackers. Um, today I have some fresh fruit. Um, dried nuts are always fun. And you basically take it and put them in places that you knew that you know that it would help um, the cheeses and the different products pop. Something pretty for the eye and you can put them in all different spots. They don't always have to be all in one spot. And the, the other thing I will share about cheese boards is there's no wrong way to do it. Um, you do wanna have enough cheese for however big of a party you're having or company, but for me, there's usually leftovers. I over plan, obviously, um, but they're very easy to do and super simple. And there is really no way of organizing it. And it always ends up coming together in the end. And they're perfect for any occasion. And they're trending right now. If, if you've seen any social media, there's a lot of hype on uh, cheese boards and charcuterie boards. Um, with that being said, since we're talking about celebrating, here at Crave Cheese, this year is our 20th anniversary. And to celebrate that, we are hosting a recipe contest for both consumers and professional chefs. Uh, it's free to enter, and I'm going to direct you to our website at cravecheese.com. Um, you can read all about how, uh, to, how to enter, and it closes March 21st. So the deadline is sneaking up. So if you'd like to enter, you can enter um, any, any of your favorite recipes you've seen, uh, Crave Brothers cheeses. They can also be purchased online if you don't have it near a store near you. And one of the things that you mentioned, Roseanne, was cutting the cheese in different shapes to add some interest. And uh, there, I mean, that's one of the things I love about putting cheese curds on a cheese board is that you don't have to bother with cutting them. They just go on in a, in a wonderful pile. Um, but if anyone know, wants to know how to cut different shapes of cheeses, because there's obviously different ways to cut cheese if it's in a wedge or if it's in a wheel, um, we have a guide to that on um, our website, which is culturecheesemag.com. Um, so we have a few questions. Um, let's see, and I have some, we're gonna go back to Adam and Tina. 
but I have one for you guys. Are there any interesting sustainable solutions being worked on for non-plastic cheese wrapping or containers? Um, well, we currently are working on something, but I can't say anything specific about that, but that always is on our mind about um, the packaging and recyclability and the waste that goes to landfills uh, versus recycling. So um, we are working on something and uh, hopefully you'll see some uh, new and innovative things coming uh, in the future from us. Great, thank you. Okay. Is everyone tasting their cheeses? Does anyone want to comment about their cheeses and what their taste, what, what the, what's their, what are their favorites? Sorry. Let's see. Maybe we can bring um, Adam and Tina back too and have um, them both spotlighted. Oh, somebody said, OMG, this chocolate mascarpone is fantastic. Um, so, okay, here's the question. When building a board, how much cheese in ounces should you plan per person? Yeah, so uh, generally it's about one to two, sometimes three, depending on if it's an appetizer at the main event um, for snacking. But yeah, I think a safe, safe bet is one to two ounces of both. Great. Okay. Someone says just starting Munster. Mm. Um, and we had a question about Munster. This is interesting. What is the orange on Munster and why did they add it to the cheese? Yeah, I can address that one. It's a good question. We get that a lot, actually. Um, it, it honestly is just a, a natto coloring, you know, for the look of it. And I've, I've heard a few different stories on whether, um, why it is on there. I, I've heard that um, at one time it going way back at Munster was maybe as had some of it was being made as a smear cheese where it would have like an orange kind of smear ripening to it. Um, but then I also heard that that's not true. It's just at one point in time in the history, somebody said, put some orange on some Munster and it looked good. And, and that, that was the end of the story. So I'm not sure. I think it's one or the other, but you know, long story short, it actually is just, you know, obviously it, it really defines Munster. I think it, it obviously does make it look pretty and, it, and that's how you kind of, that's what you look for, right? When you're looking for Munster, but it doesn't in all honesty have any functionality other than the, the look of it. Great. And what is brick cheese from a West Coaster? Because brick is definitely a Midwest cheese. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's kind of another tough question in that um, there are a few different bricks. Um, the brick we make is just a real mild, you know, semi, soft cheese, actually really similar flavor to our Munster, um, but without the red rind. So it is just an all white cheese. There are, um, there are some more flavored bricks that are made. There's like a chalet brick that has, is aged. And um, there's also there, like I had mentioned, uh, some of the uh, smeared, there are some smeared bricks or some smoked bricks, but so brick kind of is somewhat of a generic term. It's definitely gonna be a semi soft, but you could get a more mild brick to a more flavorful brick, but it's in general uh, similar to a Munster cheese normally. You have to expand on that. They, they originated somewhat in Wisconsin area where they took cheese and they made it into a, they put it in a brick form and then they, they smash the, the, the curd and made a brick loaf or brick style. So it relates to somewhat the original shape of the cheese. Um, but exactly what Adam said with, with the flavor profile of it, um, but it, it kind of is more of a Midwestern type style of, of cheese. We've got some great comments. Um, everybody seems to love the mascarpone. Um, mm -hmm. And somebody else is loving the marinated mozzarella, great with red wine. Mm -hmm. I want to slightly melt the Munster. Um, and Somebody, okay, what kind of milk is used to make Munster and is the rennet also microbial? And I think you answered the question, is the, is the rind washed? Correct. Right. Yeah, so uh, Munster cheese is just made with uh, cow's milk and then just whole milk. Um, and the, uh, the rind, uh, so all, all our semi-soft cheeses do go through, they're made and then um, 
there's no what we call dry salting. They all go to a, a brine, a big pit brine, and that's how they pick up their salt overnight and then come out the next day dry. Um, but there's no, we don't do like a dry rub or, or any kind of a smear on it. It's um, just would have that kind of, you do kind of get that slightly hard layer on the outside from just the salt from the brining process, but that's uh, just an overnight process. And what makes mascarpone a cheese? Um, well, it comes from, it's an Italian style cheese. Um, so it's, it's acidified, it's pasteurized milk and pasteurized cream and then it's acidified. Um, it's, it's its own, it has its own uh, standard of identity for mascarpone. Um, that's what makes it so delicious and yummy for Italian. Great. Okay, and a couple, let's see, so we've done. Uh, for Adam and Tina, you mentioned collecting milk from dairies within a certain radius, but how many different dairies do you work with? Yeah, we're about 75 uh, patron farms. Great. Uh, and any reason you decided to move to Feta from Swiss? Um, it was mainly uh, just the markets at the time, you know, um, they said for just the Swiss cheese, I think is maybe some of the immigrants got older and the market, you know, maybe the demand went down a little bit um, at the time. And yeah, kind of, we've been fortunate, you know, as I kind of went through our history, we have made a lot of different cheeses here. And I think it's been you know, part of our success is just, you know, you never want to change, but if sometimes if market dictated, you know, you got to be willing to change and, and have your eyes open for opportunities, of course. And uh yeah, we've been fortunate to, um, you know, our feta cheese has been a, a real growing cheese. It seems like uh, as more people try it, you know, they, they fall in love with it in general and, and see the versatility, so many dishes you can make with it. Um, so it's been a growing cheese, I think, just in that as people discover it, you know, they continue to use it. Um, and then the, the other cheeses, like a lot of great comments on the Munster and it was better by Lysa, but that's also a real versatile cheese you know it's just great in so many things on uh, sandwich of course or, or mac and cheese or pizza you name it just a real nice um creamy melty cheese okay uh can you um can each of you uh craves and klondike folks talk about what makes your cheese vats unique and when why did you start making cheese your family start making cheese so Tina and Adam, why don't you guys start? <laughs> um, sure, you know, that's a great question. I, I think, um, you know, to start with, you know, why we feel we have, you know, some of the best cheese is, is probably just, um, I start with maybe our commitment to quality, you know, uh, you know, I, a, lot of, I know a, lot of, a lot of good sayings from my father over the years, you know, uh, you know, a couple of good ones that I always reference is, you know, your first loss is your best loss, you know, you know, by that, of course, he means if, you know, once in a great while, a batch won't turn out or something happens. Um, and then, you know, if you try to push that in the market or you just eat it and make sure you're never obviously giving your value customers a bad experience. And, you know, obviously you know, we always err towards eating it, of course. Um, I think that's proven us well over the years. Um, and then, of course, in addition to that is, you know, is having good recipes. And then with that, you know, uh, cheese making, you know, I think my dad has always said is, you know, making cheese is like, driving a huge boat or a cruise ship. You just want to make small adjustments. You know, you never want to do a complete 90, you know, it's, it's so as, you know, as seasons change or milk changes, you know, you, you always want to be in tune with your cheese and always grading it and, um, and making slight adjustments as needed um, to make sure you're hitting your specs and, and obviously your flavors and everything. And um, you know, that's a couple of keys. And then of course I, I had touched earlier on, it's really important to have great milk. Um, are probably the most important, of course, and we're very fortunate to have great patrons in our area. Um, so yeah, a lot goes into it, and um, then there's some of the keys I'd say that you know we're proud of with, with our cheeses. Um, and then you know, I know you asked about how it got us into cheese making, and uh, you know I think my my great grandfather in Switzerland was a cheesemaker over there, and I think at the time there was a lot of immigration in the states because they were going through real economic woes in the mid twenties over in Europe. And so that was driving a lot of immigrants um, into the United States. And he was part of that flock. And uh, 
obviously forced you to come to a good area and, and find some farmers. It was a co-op back then when it first started. And, um, you know, obviously a good partnership, finding some farmers that needed a cheese maker. And, uh, you know, then from there, it's kind of just been part of our family. And then obviously we really all really enjoy it and are passionate about it. And it's, uh, you know, for me, it's been just a, it's a great thing. The, uh, our family, you know, being a family business, all our families right here. So you get to work with your family every day, of course. And, uh, uh, my wife's family is from this area too. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's you know, really feel fortunate. Great. Thank you. And, and the mimic, uh, a lot of um, what Adam is saying about, you know, um, the quality. Quality is first and foremost uh, here at our cheese factory. We taste and test with our cheesemakers, our packaging. I mean, it starts everyone in the plant. You know, there's, we have a quality team. Well, everyone's on that quality team. People ask me that all the time. Well, who, who is a part of the team? Everyone is. All 50 of our employees are a part of our quality team um, along the process of our cheese making. So that's um, very high, um, high on our priority um, list here. And then, like Adam said, it starts with the high quality milk, getting our milk right from our farm right across the street. I can't get any fresher than that. Um, and then that goes back to the raising of the calves. You saw the baby calf on the screen and also to the crops. Um, you have the crops, the cow, the cheese, the consumer, um, as George um, would say. Um, but it starts at every, every point in the process. You make high quality feed for the cows to produce high quality milk for the cheese making. And we produce uh, high quality cheese for the consumers here at the cheese factory. Um, so that's very important to us. And how we got started in the in the cheese making uh, 20 years ago, as Roseanne said, we're celebrating our 20th year in production. That's crazy um, to us here, um, to what we started with, to what we have now. Um, but the, they were farming before that. Um, they had probably 800 cows at that time. And as dairy markets were, um, and as the family was growing too, and to support the family, how could they add value to their product was, was the question. How are we gonna sustain this process and be able to have the next generation come on board with us? And they looked at fluid milk and cheese making and what better way, um, partnership with CDR um, and all the resources that we have in Wisconsin, we're very fortunate um, as Tina was talking um, about the Master Cheesemaker Short Course um, and also the Wisconsin logo, Wisconsin is the only state that requires cheesemakers to be licensed. Um, we take great pride in that in Wisconsin. And uh, so with the help of um, dairy farmers of Wisconsin and CDR, uh, the brothers or George took some milk in um, there and um, they produced some fresh mozzarella. And 20 years ago, if you would have asked what fresh mozzarella was, no one would have known what that was on the market. And he brought it home to the brothers and said, hey, this is what we're going to make. And they're like, what is this? And uh, 20 years later, we couldn't be happier with uh, the fresh mozzarella where it's gone in the market and all the other uh, wonderful cheeses that we made. So that's how we got into the cheese making business. Wonderful. I love it. And yes, 20 years ago, fresh mozzarella, maybe if you lived in New York, you know, or Chicago, you might know what it is, but otherwise, no. Um, somebody asked a really, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. As Midwesterners, we didn't know what that was. We know. No. <laughs> I guarantee you no one in Maine knew what it was either. Um, so somebody asked a really important question. Can one freeze cheese? No, 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 is what we say at culture. What do you guys say? No. Yeah, that's true. You know, the, uh, <laughs> especially the different types, there's some like uh, the feta cheese, um, you know, if it's a lot of fetas and pails like the restaurants and then that's like the worst case because feta is pretty high moisture and it just, it blows it up like you threw a bomb in it, you know, so, but the other, some cheeses, there's a little more, you know, forgiveness, like, you know, I guess that we haven't played as much like some cheeses, if you freeze it and thaw it out, it, it definitely breaks the bonds and, and makes it softer. It'll, it'll kind of wreck your texture and, and depending on your moisture and the cheese, some are worse than others, but in general, it's of course, it is hard on it, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. The only cheese in my freezer are um, Parmesan rinds, which I, I, I 
I hope everybody knows this trick. If you uh, finish with your Parmesan cheese, you freeze the rinds and save them to throw in a soup to add flavor to a broth. And it's amazing. Um, what is your favorite part about farming? I guess that goes to the Crave family. Um, so I grew up on the farm. Um, I actually live about less than a mile away. So when I was growing up, I would do anything from helping out with calf chores, you know, like feeding, bottle feeding little baby calves, like the one we saw in the picture. Um, but it's totally different when it's with your family and when you end up having like an end product uh, award winning, may I add. Um, I, so I would definitely say just kind of the entire process and knowing that what you're doing, um, whether it's crops or taking care of calves or milking, anything within the farming process is very like, this process of producing cheese is very dependent on what you do there. So that's why we have such good practices and it's just something I'm personally really proud of um, from being from a family farm and having that consistency all the way through the process. I agree with Roseanne of just being, um, you can be outdoors and I bring my kids all the time to feeding the calves or showing calves at the, the local fair or just being a part, part of a family. Mm -hmm. um, also, I grew up on a family farm outside of the Cray farm, just down the road. Um, so this was uh, very similar, but just being, having, having a part in each part of the, pro or being able to have a part in each part of the process along the way, um, it's really gratifying. Great. And do, do either of your um, creameries allow visitors, someone is asking? So we, yeah, we, um, um, currently we only do tours um, for potential, maybe like an existing customer. Um, at this time, we don't do public touring only because we do not necessarily have a good viewing area or a viewing room. Um, we, yes, everything's, pre, you know, through the plant. Um, so we keep that very limited so we can keep the high quality um, process and the high quality um, for our cheeses and whatnot. Yeah, um, ours is the same um, as Klondike Cheese. Um, we host retailers and pot potential um, clients, uh, potential buyers, tours, but unfortunately we're not open to the business. Um, but if you are from the Midwest and in Wisconsin, um, check out our Facebook page and keep in tune with that because we are going to be hosting a breakfast on the farm where we will be giving tours of the farm to the public. And that happens in June. So um, check out our Facebook page and website for more information about that. To come. To yes. come. <laughs> that sounds great. I wish I'd lived closer. Um, a question about the mozzarella that I'm pretty sure I know the answer to, but is the mozzarella stretched by hand? No, unfortunately it is not. We have um, cookers and molders that are from Italy. Um, that do that for us. Um, so we don't over exercise our hands too much. <laughs> yes. Um, you also have to have really hot water, right? To make mozzarella. So it's not just the, you know, your hands have to be able to stand being in, in quite hot water if Correct. you do it by yeah. hand. Yep. Uh, another question I think everybody um, could answer, you guys could answer um, in your own way. Um, are there specific difficulties about being in the cheese market these days? Yeah, as I could start, um, you know, for us, to, um, one of the things right now we're dealing with is, you know, uh, labor shortages. Um, it is tough getting people in, uh, as of course, I'm sure a lot of you heard across a lot of industries across the whole United States right now, and we're, of course, no exception. Um, and so that's the challenge. Um, and it seems to as we, you know, get to more and more younger generations, you know, the, you know, uh, and everybody's heard this before too, but, you know, a lot of the younger generation doesn't want the backbreaking work, you know, like some of our, our, the older generations have grown up with. So, you know, to combat that, we've tried to, you know, automate, especially the, the harder jobs, you know, the ones backbreaking work, you know, so we have been trying to automate over the years and we've done some, um, but we need to continue to, 
we always we feel if we want to keep growing and, and keep making good cheese, we're going to need to continue to automate and continue to take away some of them backbreaking jobs in the operation. Um, and then another, the other big thing we've got going on right now is, you know, the supply chain issues, of course, affect us like everybody else too. The a lot of rising costs, you know, and with the packaging and um, coming in and, and flavors and things like that. So a lot of high ingredient costs and trying to pass that on, the, you know, the only way for us to survive is to pass that on to consumers. And sometimes there's pretty big delays, you know, you got annual contracts and things. So sometimes it's really hard to pass that on to, to make sure we're making our margin so we can, you know, keep moving forward. So all things, you know, obviously we can and are dealing with, but those are just a couple of the challenges, main challenges in the industry right now that we see. Well, and just to reiterate what Adam said with automation, the automation isn't necessarily to replace people because um, with automation, we still need qualified people to run the equipment and run the machinery and run the, you know, the automation part of it. So it's really, we, we implement it or do that and so we can, um, yes, help alleviate, like Adam said, the, the backbreaking work where cheese making it originally, like people were picking up 40 pound blocks or even heavier blocks or turning loaves and it was very um, labor intensive. Um, and, and so, yeah, the, the whole objective is to try to help eliminate those jobs and make it easier um, for other people. Yeah, so as we've done that, like Tia said, we haven't, we never laid anybody off, but then of course it opens the door for, we got a lot more, maintenance help, for example, than we used to have and, and uh, higher level operators and things to operate some of our um, equipment, so. I have to mimic everything that they are saying to um, supply chain and labor um, and the automation. We're going through an automation um, right now and so we can be more efficient, but not re necessarily replace people like Tina was saying too, that. Um, we're still going to have all the employees, but uh, just be more efficient and be able to produce more um, to have product on the shelves to our customers. I have a question um, about the chocolate mascarpone. Um, I noticed the texture of the chocolate mascarpone is different from other mascarpones. I looked at the container and noticed it has agar gum. Does the added cocoa powder make the mascarpone thin out? And is that why the thickener is used? So that is the ingredients that are on the back of that container. So our chocolate mascarpone is made the same way as our plain mascarpone, but we add a chocolate syrup and an Irish cream flavoring. So those are the ingredients in the Irish cream flavoring and the syrup that we use. So you might get a little bit different texture um, on that product, but it's a really nice silky texture. It sets up the pretty much the same as our traditional mascarpone. Yeah, there are a lot of lovely comments about the mascarpone that it's silky and um, not grainy like some other mascarpones and- um, Melts in your mouth. And, uh, if anyone wants to enter a, res the, a recipe contest using the chocolate mascarpone, that would be wonderful. Um, that's our newest product um, of our line, and we don't have a lot of recipes using it. So we would love to entertain some fun ideas for chocolate mascarpone. Someone is asking about ordering the chocolate mascarpone online. Can you do that? Yes, you can at cravecheese.com. We have an online um, link on there, we have an online store that we can ship directly to you. Excellent, excellent. Um, somebody else said it's pretty good just smeared on a cracker, honestly. <laughs> so, when people great. ask me what should I do with it, I'm like, eat it with a spoon? <laughs> hey. Um, uh, we do have someone saying they're not seeing it online. We can maybe um, get back to that person. Sure. Afterwards, yes. yeah. Um, so let's see. Oh, what kind of dishes do you suggest using the chocolate mascarpone? In, in other words, other than just eating it with a spoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can make uh, chocolate frostings, chocolate cheesecakes, um, a chocolate tiramisu. Um, 
pretty much anything dessert. Um, you can even use that in our chocolate mascarpone pie instead of using the plain, or you can do a tuxedo mascarpone pie using the plain and like a um, vanilla base and then a chocolate um, cheesecake base. So there's lots of fun techniques you can do with it or if you like uh, fresh fruit, um, raspberries like on this cheese board, you can pipe a little chocolate in the center or cut a rose um, like in a strawberry and then pipe chocolate mascarpone in that as a nice little bite. Sounds amazing. We did get a question earlier about pairings and I, I'm thinking maybe I'm going to ask um, Tina and Adam about a couple of pairing ideas with their cheeses since we've been, we've talked uh, uh, about the Crave cheeses and kind of what they go with, but maybe you can both do that. We've only got, we've only got about four minutes. So maybe, um, maybe Tina, you can, you can share some ideas for some of your cheeses. Yeah, I'll make it quick. Um, so the, the feta cheese, um, you know, if you're just gonna eat, uh, you can cube it, but it would be like dried apricots um, dried prunes, your fruits, um, those are all really, and honey goes well with it. Um, Adam's a big proprietary person of yeah. doing it in scrambled eggs. I would say, uh, you take the scrambled, my scrambled egg challenge is if you put it in your eggs, you'll probably never have eggs without feta again. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with that, Adam. I, I'm a big feta in my scrambled eggs person. Yeah, so, and so we have some flavored fetas that add a little, you know, more more punch to it. Because um, feta in general is a little bit saltier with cheese. So anything that's um, salty and sweet combination. Um, watermelon and feta is really good with a balsamic oil all over it. Um, so besides salads, and, and, and feta will melt. So it doesn't, it gets soft. It gets, gets doesn't melt completely, but it gets soft. So you could put it, as we substitute it for your ricotta in a lasagna. Instead, use feta for a feta lasagna. Um, and then... And one other last thing on the feta for Tina moves on is it's really good on a frozen pizza. If you just take your general frozen mm -hmm. pizza, and then since it doesn't, it just softens, not melt, you can put it on right away and throw it in and uh, just adds a ton more good flavor to your, you know, whatever ordinary frozen pizza you like to use. So. And of course the the big TikTok crave if everybody's seen the feta baked pasta we take the chunk of feta and you put the pasta and the tomato and tomato sauce. Yeah, it's just bake it all together and it's like a gooey melting, yeah, hunk of good cheese that's mixed with your pasta and sauce. So um, yeah, that would be about feta. And and Munster is a great cheese. It's pretty mild. So I said, you can, you could, uh, you know, make sandwiches and um, add it in, melt it on anything, burgers, um, or just as a snack, like, cause it is a pretty mild snack, so. You've got some, somebody served the feta with cherry jalapeno jelly. That sounds amazing. Love it. Yeah. 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 Really good. Really good. And Beth and, and uh, Roseanne, do you want to add a couple of pairing ideas with some of your cheeses to, to just wrap us up? Sure. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uses too. So for our fresh mats, uh, obviously the uh, basic caprese salad. Um, our regular marinated is delicious in that. You can even add the oil to different pasta for a pasta salad. Um, you can put it on your bread to make a nice bruschetta or uh, we also like to dip crostini in it as well. Uh, so there's a lot of different uses and pairings for our marinated. Um, if we're talking about just our regular fresh mozzarella, it's actually delicious with fruit. Uh, you can have it with different melon, berries. Um, there's so many different uh, pairings for just the plain, since it is such a subtle flavor, a fresh milky flavor. It goes well with sweet things as well. Uh, for talking about our cheese curds, you can always make a fun poutine. I actually had that this week and it was really good. Um, otherwise, it's just your your favorite snack, especially here in Wisconsin. Uh, we're talking about the regular mascarpone, like Beth was mentioning. There's so many uses for desserts, but it's actually super fun to use in other things like a pasta sauce or a pizza. We have a really good pizza recipe on our website, as well as um, yeah, the basic sweet applications. Yeah, and the farmer for cream cheese, 
Um, it comes in a coil package, so you can string it, make long strings, tie little knots in it, and then garnish soups and salads with that. So it adds as a decoration, um, but also adds flavor to the dish as well. So the sky's the limit with all of our cheeses, as, long, uh, as well as the Klondike cheeses. Uh, we love partaking in a lot of those here um, at our cheese factory when Roseanne brings them back to share with us. <laughs> Well, we are at time at 6.01. So I wanna thank you all for um, being with us today, Beth and Roseanne and Adam and Tina. This has been really fun and we've gotten so many great comments. I know that everyone else enjoyed it too. And so from the culture team, uh, thank you to all of our participants and everybody who was part of this fun time this afternoon. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, what I say thanks to everybody as well. Great questions and a lot of fun. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.